or we could we could entitle this message kind of like a long title testing new revelations prophecies visions manifestations and or works of the holy spirit testing new revelations prophecies visions manifestations and or works of the holy spirit we live in a time, and I, I think a better way would put it, we live in an age or a period of time that there seems to be a lot going on. How many see that? We had the eclipse this week. How many got out and watched it with the special glasses? I didn't. I was like, oh, well. You know, you had with the eclipse, you had some people declaring it was the end of the world. We're still here. You know, you have, we're in an election year in the United States. We could be in an election year in Canada, depending on what things happen in the government. Last night, we had some incredible developments over in the Middle East. Incredible, I'm not saying necessarily good. I'm just saying incredible in the fact that we have Iran, Sending in missiles and drones, if you don't know, and attacking Israel. Uh, and, and all of that taking place over in the Middle East. And so the time is ripe with a lot of things happening in our world. We also have in our world today many people coming out and declaring all the different things that they believe. We have many different YouTube prophets. How many see that? Everybody on YouTube telling us what's going to happen. We have YouTube visionaries. We have people giving out new revelations. We have many people nowadays who seem to say that God spoke to them about this and that. And we also have in our world sometimes different and crazy manifestations that take place. And so we have to look at these things and understand we have to judge these things. Now, there are ex some extremes to the responses because of those, some of these happenings in our world. Some of the extremes that happen, while we have, we have in the charismatic and the Pentecostal side, if you want to say, those who accept it all. Everything is God. Nothing is tested. Testing is questioning the Holy Spirit. If someone says it's the Holy Spirit, then they, everybody kind of just seems to grab hold of it and say that it's true. If someone says this is a new re revelation from God, people turn around and just accept it and take it all in. You have all manner of degrees of strange and outlandish activities, prophecies, and even teachings sometimes in the church. That's one extreme to the response. Another extreme to the response is kind of on the other side. We have those who are call themselves cessationists, who don't believe in any form or work or gift of the Holy Spirit, who don't believe in any form of prophecy or vision, who declare all these things found in Scripture, because we do find prophecy, we do find vision and so forth. We find these things in Scripture. They say they've stopped and ceased. And they lump all those who believe in these activities as, at best, as deceived Christians and to the worst side, which is basically their full-on heresies or heretics or false teachers. Then we have, if you want to say, mainline churches, many mainline churches who on paper say they believe in the activities, say they believe in the works of the Holy Spirit. They talk about wanting it but they neglect it and they quench it because they're scared of the fanaticism and don't want to deal with what looks to be an uncomfortable situation. And this morning, I want us to go through it and understand what Scripture says as far as testing is concerned. How many know that you shouldn't just receive something anybody says because they said, Thus saith the Lord. Okay? We need to recognize what Scripture says regarding these things. 
And we live in a time and a day and an age where it would seem with a lot of things that are happening in the world, deception can come quite easily. The first verse that I had wanted you to look up, Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 says this, and you can write them down if you can't keep up. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. This tells us there are going to be false prophets that come into our world. Even false prophets that are going to come into our church. Do you notice something about it? What does he say that they're going to wear? Sheep's clothing. Which means what? They're going to look like sheep. And do you know that sheep in the scripture is oftentimes a picture or a reference to Christians. So these false prophets are going to look a lot like Christians. They're going to put on the, the clothing, not necessarily the physical clothing, but they're going to put on the outward appearance of being a Christian. Another verse that Jesus spoke about, speaking about in the end time, says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 11, and many false prophets will arise. He goes on down in verse 24 to say that these false prophets will perform great signs and wonders and lead many astray if it was even possible to lead the elect astray. Are we okay, brother? I'll let you get down. It's interesting that there will be supernatural or what it will appear to be supernatural be activities behind what these pro false prophets do. In other words, just because someone gives a display, a supernatural display of something that we can't understand with our physical senses or it may look like they perform signs and wonders, we shouldn't just simply accept them as things of God. Many people get caught with that today. The person can perform signs and wonders or make it look like they perform signs and wonders, and so they get deceived by it. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 1 says this, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Peter is telling us a fact here, not just that it's a possibility, but he said that they were even among you. Speaking, they were even among the church. They weren't just outside the church, but that these prophets and these teachers were working secretly. It wasn't that their teaching necessarily was secret, but the destructive nature of their teaching is hidden. Listen, no false prophet or no false teacher is going to come in and wave a white big banner or flag above their head and say, by the way, I'm a false teacher, I'm a false prophet. They're not going to do that. They don't announce themselves. And they spread false destructive heresies that harm people by telling lies about Christ and his work in us and for us. I simply want us to understand today that there is a place in the church there is a place in our lives that we have to be aware that these individuals are resident in among us. They are working. They are actively involved. They are actively at work to bring about the destruction of the kingdom of God, to bring about the destruction of the church, and to bring about the destruction of your life. And that is why, as Christians, we have to understand that testing what happens in a church, testing what a preacher says, testing what a prophet says, testing what a pastor says needs to take place. How many know that? You have to test what I say. The day that I get up and say don't test what I say is the day that I should resign because you should be testing every word that I say. 
You should be looking into a scripture and say, is this true or not? Testing is essential as a Christian. You can write this verse down. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. It's an interesting scripture because it says this. First of all, do not quench the spirit. Praise God. Secondly, it says, do not despise prophecies. Praise God. But then he goes on to say, verse 21, but test what? Everything. And hold fast what is good. To quench means to put out. How many have been camping? You ever been camping? And you build a fire, right? And what happens at the end when you're leaving? You're supposed to throw a lot of water on that fire. You're supposed to quench that fire, put it out, right? That's what quench the spirit is. He says, do not quench the spirit. We're not supposed to quench the spirit in the church. He says, do not despise prophecies. We are to recognize that the Lord speaks. We are a church that believes in the prophetic word. We are a church that believes in the gifts of the Spirit. We are the church that believes in the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we are to be thankful and open to the voice of God speaking to our hearts and lives. But he then says, test all things and hold fast to what is good. Do you know that evil and spiritual deception can show itself in a spiritual setting? So Christians need to test everything. You need to, let me get rid of this because it's getting in my, getting in my way. You need to test all things. And we'll get into how we test it in a moment. But that is one scripture that tells us to test everything. Another scripture is found in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. He says there, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God for many false prophets have gone out into the world. John says here, do not believe every spirit. John warned against believing every spirit. That is, we are to never assume every spiritual experience. Or you're not to assume every demonstration of the spirit is God himself behind it. We must test spiritual experiences, manifestations, phenomena to see if they are in fact from God. Do you know there are other sources of so-called phenomena? There are other sources of so-called spiritual manifestation? It's not just simply God. Some of it can be demonic. Some of it can be evil. By the way, some of it can be even just us acting out. It is easy to become impressed and amazed when encountering the spiritual world and not asked whether it is of God or not. And this leads to being easily deceived. So he says, but test the spirits. Test the spirits whether they are of God. This is the responsibility of every Christian but especially of congregational leadership. We'll get into that in a minute. When you're watching on YouTube, test the Spirit. When you're seeing something take place, test the Spirit. When you hear something, a vision, test the Spirit. Behind it. Don't just openly accept it just because it looks good. Another verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. It's an interesting thing because Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. The church is to 
is to earnestly desire spiritual gifts. The church is to earnestly desire that the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the working of the Holy Spirit to be active in the church. We should desire those things. We should desire the, the working of prophecy. But it's an interesting thing because Paul goes down to verse 29 and he says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. In other words, let others test it and see, is it of God? No, thus saith the Lord, should be received without judging it. You say, do we do that here? Yes. Do you know that every time a prophetic word comes, I'm evaluating it when I'm sitting, usually I'm sitting up there playing bass. I'm evaluating it in my mind. I'm testing it in my mind. I'm walking through it in my mind. I'm judging it in my mind. And I'll tell you something, as your pastor, if I felt something was way off base, I would shut it down immediately. I would. And if I would need to, I would address it. So there is a testing that goes on here even at the church. I don't necessarily come down and say, okay, now we're going to test the word. No, I'm testing it as we're going along. We are to test and weigh what comes out. We are to test and weigh the manifestations of the Spirit. We are to test and weigh whether or not God is moving by His Spirit or whether it's something else. Here's another interesting verse. Matthew 7, think about this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not what? Prophesy in your name. And cast out, think about this, and cast out demons in your name. And do mighty, many mighty works in your name. And then will I declare to them, I never what? Knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Interesting. Just a warning. Paul says this in Galatians chapter 1. Verse 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven, think about that. I've heard of some people saying, well, an angel showed up to me. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. Just because a pastor gets up or a teacher gets up and says, this angel showed up at my door and gave me this new revelation, guess what you should probably do? Run. Just a thought. Get just a thought. Because most of the time, many times, it's false. And we'll get into it. How to test these things, whether they are from God or not. How to test. And this is the big thing. I have three, four thoughts for you on this. First of all, can it be tested? What do I mean by can it be tested? If someone suggests that what is happening or what is being said cannot be tested, then it's probably not from God. If someone doesn't want it to be tested, it's probably not from God. If someone doesn't allow it to be tested, it's probably not from God. If someone doesn't allow it to be questioned, it's probably not from God. We've just read it here in the Scriptures. 1 Thessalonians 5, test everything. 1 John 4, test the Spirit to see whether they are from God or not. The Scripture tells us to test things. Anyone, any activity, or any word of God that cannot be scrutinized should probably be cast aside as not from the Lord because anything from the Holy Spirit will stand up to being tested. That's why I tell you today, if I ever say to you, do not test or do not look at the Word of God, do not question the things that I say against the Word of God, if I tell you those things, I should probably resign. Or if you hear a pastor say those things, or a teacher say those things, or a prophet say those things, you shouldn't listen to them. 
Recently, I've come, in, I've come across two situations. I had two situations where people have come to me. And in the past, I would kind of let things go. Today, I'm not so gracious, if you want to say, to let things go. Because I don't think it's helping people nowadays. I had two situations where people came to me and suggested to me that the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit of God, had spoken things to their heart. The idea that was given to me was that they were not obligated to be part of a local church. They were not part of, they were not obligated to be part of the assembly. That being at home, watching church online, having Christian friends is enough. And that this is in line with what God has impressed upon their hearts, that the Spirit of God spoke these things to, to them. The interesting thing, when I came out and I suggested things from what Scripture says, the Bible says what? Do not forsake what? The assembling of yourselves together. That's just one verse. All right? There's a whole bunch of different other concepts that we can get from Scripture that help us understand that as Christians, we need to gather together. But I began to question things with them, and I began to say these things are, you know, or, or, I was trying to be nice about it, but I questioned these things, and suddenly they become offended and defensive because of what I bring up with Scripture. If it is God, it can withstand scrutiny. If it is God, it will not easily be offended when withstanding scrutiny. So if somebody comes in and says, thus saith the Lord, or this is the vision that I have from God, or this is what God's speaking to me, and it doesn't stand up, or they don't want to be tested, or they don't want to be called to account on it, then you know what? Throw it out. Another thing to, be, to, to determine whether it can be tested or not, is there self-control behind it? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 32, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. There's a principle here that the Holy Spirit is gentle and as a dove and does not override your faculties. The Holy Spirit doesn't make you do something against your will. He doesn't force himself upon you. Again, I was in a recent situation, and it seems to be happening more and more today because there's just more and more garbage out there today that people grab a hold on to. I was in a situation where the claim was made that God, that the Holy Spirit, made this person carry out certain activities in their life. Now, the interesting thing was it wasn't necessarily sinful, but the activities were unhealthy. And when I questioned it with the person, I said, listen, the Holy Spirit doesn't force you to do anything. The Holy Spirit doesn't make you do anything. The instruction was not received. Here's an interesting thing biblically. It appears in Scripture, the only spirit that ever forced itself upon someone and made them do some things that they were involuntary or had no voluntary, that they, that they basically couldn't control themselves, was a demonic or an evil spirit. If someone says, I can't control this, You have to question the spirit behind it. I'm going to give one word of caution regarding this. The move of the spirit can sometimes overwhelm somebody's emotion. I've seen where people, the spirit comes upon them, they cry. They, get, they become joyful when he moves upon them. That's where, as leadership and as a church, we have to allow for maturity. We have to allow for a place of growth. We have to allow for instruction. We have to allow for understanding. But generally, the Holy Spirit is not going to force you to do anything in your life.
Number three way to test it is what is the fruit of their lives? Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 to 20 says this, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the tree, diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor a diseased tree can bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruit. Jesus is saying here, basically, you'll know people, you'll know ministries, you'll know individuals by their fruits. We guard ourselves against false prophets and false teachers by looking at their fruits. This means paying attention to their lives and to their ministry. We should pay, we should pay attention to how they live. Do they re demonstrate righteousness? Do they demonstrate humility? Do they demonstrate faithfulness? We should pay attention to the content of their teaching. Is it true fruit from God's word, or is it man-centered? Is it appealing to the ears that want to be tickled? We should be, pay attention to how they ask things. Listen to me today. Someone comes to you and says, if you give me, I saw it this week. I, this, is not, this is something I saw this week. Prophet, if you give me $500, I'll give you a prophetic word. Here's the crazy thing. They have thousands upon thousands of followers. Which means that many people are listening to them. Which means many people are going to them for prophetic words, probably. Give me $500, I'll, I'll pray a prayer of deliverance over your life. Oh, by the way, you're going to need three sessions. That's garbage, folks. That's not fruit. There is a big difference, okay? There is a big difference if you ever are blessed by a ministry and you want to bless a ministry and you voluntarily decide in your own heart to give to a ministry because of what they've blessed you with. There's a big difference between that and somebody getting up here and saying, listen to me, give me this amount of money, and I will do this for you through the Spirit of God. Unfortunately, it happens all too often. We should pay attention to the effect of their teacher. Are people growing in Jesus or merely being entertained? Jesus says here, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. The fruit is the inevitable result of who somebody is. So you have to look at the tree and see what the fruit they're bearing. Does that mean they're going to live a perfect life? No. Does that mean that they're not going to mistake, make mistakes? No. But generally, what sort of fruit are they bringing forth? You and I have a right to look at it, question it, evaluate it, and determine whether or not we're going to follow their ministry or follow what they say by the fruit that they say or speak. Which brings us to number four, which is probably the biggest one and the longest one, if you want to say, and probably, if you want to say, the most important, because it, it, it kind of carries all these things together. Does what being said, does what being expressed, does it align with Scripture, or does it align with the principles of Scripture? Psalm 119, verses 160 says this, The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. God's word is truth. Amen. John 17:17 17, 17 says this, sanctify them in the truth and your word is truth. 
2, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says this. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped, and equipped for every good work. God's word is for our correction. God's word is for our training. God's word is for our teaching. God's word is for our instruction. God's word provides all that we need in that aspect. Here's another interesting verse. John chapter 16, verse 13 to 15 says this. When the spirit of truth, when the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. We need to understand in the Christian church today that the Holy Spirit, who is the author of Scripture, by the way, it was the Holy Spirit who inspired the writers of Scripture. He will never contradict or speak differently to what Scripture says. If Scripture is truth and the Holy Spirit is truth, they will always align. He will never move or speak differently to the revelation of Scripture. He will not function outside of glorifying Jesus Christ. He will not glorify a person. And he will only confirm the Word of God, and he will only confirm who Christ is. All revelation, and we'll get into that in a minute, All manifestation, all works of the Holy Spirit is going to be affirmed and confirmed by Scripture in one way or another. Let's talk about the how about new or fresh revelations. Doesn't that sound so spiritual? If I got up on Sunday morning and said, I got a new fresh revelation from God. Sounds so good. If they are meant, let me say it this way. If they are meant, if that is meant as something new, in other words, outside of what Scripture says, absolutely not. No way. There are no new revelations. I think sometimes people get up and use the wrong phrasing. I think sometimes what people mean by a new revelation is they're basically saying, I have a better understanding of what Scripture says. And by the way, that's, that is true. The Holy Spirit will come in and teach us and guide us and give us even a greater understanding of what God says. But there are no new revelations. There are no new books to add on to the Bible. The Book of Mormon, that's pretty obvious. Not Scripture. The Jehovah Witness Bible, not Scripture. Other so-called inspired writings, not Scripture. Other so-called revelations, not Scripture. I I had a great revelation come by my way this week. I'm I'm being sarcastic about that. The revelation was this. That the marriage supper of the Lamb is speaking about some sort of blessing that husbands and wives can have and so that we can be married in heaven. The marriage supper of the Lamb is not the joining of the church, the bride of Christ, with Christ himself himself. Jesus, but the marriage supper of the Lamb is is all about 
the second blessing that you and I have as husbands and wife, and that if we will do something here upon earth, then we can live in eternity with our spouses in heaven. Married. Insane. Insane. Some of the things are very easy to discern against Scripture. Those who, there's people out there who say hell isn't real. I've had a new revelation. Hell isn't real. Not true. There's revelation sometimes in the Christian church or so-called Christian church called universalism, which means that everyone at some point will go to heaven. That's pretty easy to debunk when you get into Scripture. You got some cults out there sometimes who, like the Mormons, believe that Jesus Christ was the firstborn spirit child of the Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. New revelations that are not in Scripture, but that we should take and believe because somebody says that the Spirit of God speaks to them. You know what we should do with those things? Cast them aside. Don't even entertain them. And you need to be careful as a church. You say, well, I don't know all these things. They are here. They are here. Some of the things that I sometimes hear from what people believe, I just shake my head at. I'm talking about people that I know. Nobody here. If it doesn't align with Scripture, we throw it away. No matter how good it sounds, no matter the origin of it, no matter how spiritual it sounds, we throw it out. These destructive heresies, these destructive teachings, these destructive visions, these destructive, prophe pro destructive prophecies are to come in and destroy the people of God, to destroy people's lives. Let me talk about this. What if it's, there's no clear verse about it? What if there's no real clear verse about it? Let me say this. It will not go against scriptural principles. There are principles of scripture that you can align and go through all, you can, where you can walk through scripture and see it in scripture, and, and it, it may not be a specific verse that relates to the subject that you're talking about, but there are scriptural principles that will give you understanding and a way to discern whether or not what's being said is true or not. Let me speak about two. Give you two examples. And this, this first one is not what I'm hoping or anything like that. I just want to give you an understanding. Back in 2020, we had the United States election. What happened before that election? You had many prophets coming out and saying what? Trump would win. How many remember that? Okay, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not using this to tell you who I wanted to win or not. That's not what I'm saying. We all know what happened, though. Trump didn't win. Whether or not, and I'm not talking about whether it's stolen or anything. Okay, that's not the point. Point is, Trump didn't become the president of the United States. What did many of the prophets do? Some came out and said they made a mistake. For that, I was like, okay, you admitted your mistake and move forward. Many people, though, and even prophets turned around and said what? Satan stole the election. Just think about that. In other words, God had a desired outcome, which was prophesied, and Satan defeated and beat God by stealing the election. 
Satan, a defeated foe in Scripture, somehow outsmarted, outwit, and beat God. That's what we're saying, which is completely false to Scripture. Where in Scripture ever do we see any idea that Satan can stand against and beat or override the will of God? Never one place. But rather than people coming out and saying, I blew it, I made a mistake, I didn't hear God, they came up with a crazy excuse that sounded so spiritual and many Christians bought it hook, line, and sinker. And listen, it could happen this year too. I'm not saying what, I'm just saying you could probably hear a whole bunch of prophecies come and I, I see them coming. Somewhere we're going to start seeing it soon. Be careful. Here's one that just happened this week. We know about the eclipse. And people say, well, it's the rapture. It's the end of the world. You know what the Bible says? But concerning that day or hour, what? No one knows. Not even what? The angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. I watched as this well-known preacher got on TV. And he pulled out, well, what day did the eclipse happen? April 8th, which is... 4, 8. And he pulled out a scripture. Exodus chapter 4, verse 8. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. And he went on to talk about, well, look at the eclipse happened on Exodus or on 4, 8. Look at this scripture from Exodus 4, 8. They're tied together. And this eclipse is the sign from God about the things that are about to happen in the world. And specifically, he was talking like about the rapture and so forth. Listen, the rapture could happen any time. But it has nothing to do with the eclipse. And why would you necessarily pick Exodus 4.8? Why not pick Psalm 4, 8? In peace I will lay down and sleep. For you, alone, Lord, alone, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Or why not pick Matthew 4, 8? Or James 4, 8? Why Exodus 4, 8? Do you know what that's called? Numerology. Do you know what numerology is? It's an occultic belief where you are using something or trying to speak of something divine or there's some mystical relationship between a number and some sort of event out in the world. This pastor was participating in an occultic activity before the church and many people were buying into it. I woke up Monday morning in peace. I went to bed in peace. But many people will look at it and say, well, he was on TV. He spoke these things. He had a scripture to back it up. And say, well, this must be God.
That is why you and I have a responsibility to read, know, and study God's Word. So when some of these things come forward, we can immediately discern whether it's not God or, or it is God. If you're not in God's Word today, you need to get into it. If you're not looking at it, if you're not studying it, if you're not reading it, you need to get into it because it's only going to increase. Every manifestation, every work of the Spirit, every prophecy, every vision, every so-called revelation has to align with Scripture or it's not God. It's one of the reasons why I try to use so much scripture in my teaching. Because God's word has to confirm everything that we say. And the Holy Spirit, being the spirit of truth, will only lead us into truth. It will only lead us towards Christ. It will only lead us to the things of Christ. It will only lead us towards the things of God. It will only work within us the fruits of God's spirit. Today, I just want to encourage you folks, encourage the church to test things that you hear, to look and evaluate everything that you hear, everything that you read. That doesn't mean you have to uh, agree with everything. There's probably things that I say sometimes that you may not agree with. That's fine. But there should be an evaluation of what we say or what we listen to or what we hear or what we see. There should be an evaluation of it against God's word. There should be a testing of it. There should be a fruit that comes forth of it. There should be a working of the Holy Spirit so that we are walking towards it in a gentle fashion, that the Holy Spirit is not overriding or if we want to say forcing us into anything. And I believe that if we do so, we'll walk in a place of not being deceived. We'll walk in a place of not being uh, taken in the wool pulled over our eyes, but we'll be walking in a place of security in God's Word. The Word of God is our security. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 